Snake Eyes, by Tom Maddox. Dark meat in the can brown, oily, and flecked with mucus gave off a repellent, fishy smell, and the taste of it rose in his throat, putrid and bitter, like something from a dead man's stomach. George Jordan sat on the kitchen floor and vomited, then pushed himself away from the shining pool, which looked very much like what remained in the can. He thought, no, this won't do, I have wires in my head, and they make me eat cat food. The snake likes cat food. He needed help but no there was little point in calling the Air Force. He had tried them, and there was no way they were going to admit responsibility for the monster in his head. What George called the snake, the Air Force called effective human interface technology and didn't want to hear about any post-discharge problems with it. They had their own problems with congressional committees investigating the conduct of the war in Thailand. He lay for a while with his cheek on the cold linoleum, got up and rinsed his mouth in the sink, then stuck his head under the faucet and ran cold water over it, thinking, call the goddamned multicomp, then call Centrax and say, is it true you can do something about this incubus that wants to take possession of my soul? And if they ask you, what's your problem? You say cat food, and maybe they'll say, hell, it just wants to take possession of your lunch. A chair covered in brown cordery stood in the middle of the barren living room, a white telephone on the floor beside it, a television flat against the opposite whale that was the whole thing, what might have been home, if it weren't for the snake. He picked up the phone called up the directory on its screen, and keyed telecom Centrax. The Orlando holiday and stood next to the airport terminal, where tourists flowed in eager for the delights of Disney World. But for me, George thought, there are no cute, smiling ducks and rodents. Here is everywhere, it's Snake City. From the window of his motel room, he watched grey sheets of rain cascade across the pavement. He had been waiting two days for a launch. At Canaveral a shuttle sat on its pad, and when the weather cleared, a helicopter would pick him up and drop him there, a package for delivery to Centrax, incorporated, at Athena Station, over 30,000 kilometers above the equator. Behind him, under the laser light of a blaupunkt lestage, people a foot high chatted about the war in Thailand and how lucky the United States had been to escape another Vietnam. Lucky? Maybe he had been wired up and ready for combat training, already accustomed to the form-fitting contours in the rear couch of the black, Tiber-bodied General Dynamics A-230. The A-230 flew on the deadly edge of instability, every control surface monitored by its own bank of microcomputers, all hooked into the snake brain flight and tire assistant with the twin black myloprene cables running from either side of his esophagus getting off, oh yes. When the cable snapped home, and the airframe resonated through his nerves, his body singing with that identity, that power. Then Congress pulled the plug on the war, the Air Force pulled the plug on George, and when his discharge came, there he was, let with technological blue balls and this hardware in his head that had since taken on a life of its own. Lightning walked across the purpled sky, ripping it, crazing it into a giant, upturned bowl of shattered glass. Another foot-high man on the hill hostage said the tropical storm would pass in the next two hours. Hamilton Innes was tall and heavy 6'4 and about 250 pounds. Wearing a powder blue jumpsuit with Centrax in red letters down its left breast, and soft black slippers, he floated in a brightly lit white corridor, held gingerly to a wall by one of the jumpsuit's velcro patches. A view screen above the airlock entry showed the shuttle fitting its nose into the docking tube. He waited for it to mate to the airlock hatches and send in the newest candidate. This one was six months out of the service and slowly losing what the Air Force doctors had made of his mind. Former Tech Sergeant George Jordan two years community college in Oakland, California, followed by enlistment in the Air Force, aircrew training, the EHIT program. According to the profile Aleph had put together from Air Force records and a national data bank, a man with slightly above average aptitudes and intelligence, a distinctly above average taste for the bizarre thus his volunteering for EHIT and combat. In his file pictures, he looked nondescript 5'10", 176 pounds, brown hair and eyes, neither handsome nor ugly. 
but it was an old picture and could not show the snake and the fear that came with it. You don't know it, buddy, in his thought, but you ain't seen nothing yet. The man came tumbling through the hatch, more or less helpless and free fall, but Innes could see him figuring it out, willing the muscles to quit struggling, quit trying to cope with a gravity that simply wasn't there. What the hell do I do now? George Jordan asked, hanging in midair, one arm holding onto the hatch combing. Relax. I'll get you. Innes pushed off and swooped across, grabbing the man as he passed, taking them both to the opposite wall and kicking to carry them outward. LNNIS gave George a few hours of futile attempts at sleep enough time for the bright, gliding phosphines caused by the high G's of the trip up to disappear from his vision. George spent most of the time rolling around in his bunk, listening to the wheeze of the air conditioning and creaks of the rotating station. Then Innes knocked on his compartment door and said through the door speaker, Come on, fella. Time to meet the doctor. They walked through an older part of the station, where there were brown clots of fossilized gum on the green plastic flooring, scuff marks on the walls, along with faint imprints of insignia and company names icon was repeated several times in ghost lettering. Innes told George it meant the now defunct International Construction Orbital Group, the original builders and controllers of Athena. Innes stopped George in front of the door that read interface GROUP go on in, he said. I'll be around a little later. Pictures of cranes drawn with delicate white strokes on a tan silk background hung along one pale cream wall. Curved partitions in translucent foam, glowing with the soft lights placed behind them, marked a central area, then undulated away, forming a corridor that led into darkness. George was sitting on a chocolate sling couch. Charlie Hughes lying back in a chrome and brown leatherette chair, his feet on the dark veneer table in front of him, a half inch of ash hanging from his cigarette end. Hughes was not the usual MD clone. He was a thin figure in a worn grey obi, his black hair pulled back from sharp features into a waist-length ponytail, his face taut and a little wild-eyed. Tell me about the snake, Hughes said. What do you want to know? It's an implanted Mikey Mike Nexus. Yes, I know that. It's unimportant. Tell me about your experience. Ash dropped off the cigarette onto the brown mat floor covering. Tell me why you're here. Okay I had been out of the Air Force for a month or so, had a place close to Washington, in Silver Spring. I thought I'd try to get some airline work, but I was in no real hurry because I had about six months of post-discharge Benny's coming, and I thought I'd take it easy for a while. At first there was just this non-specific weirdness. I felt distant, disconnected but what the hell? Living in the USA, you know? Anyway I was just sitting around one evening, I was gonna watch a little hollow V, drink a few beers. Oh man, this is hard to explain. I felt real funny like maybe I was having, I don't know, a heart attack or a stroke. The words on the hollow didn't make any sense, and it was like I was seeing everything underwater. Then I was in the kitchen pulling. Things out of the refrigerator lunch meat, raw eggs, butter, beer, all kinds of crap. I just stood there and slammed it all down. Cracked the eggs and sucked them right out of the shell, ate the butter in big chunks, all the bologna, drank all the beer one, two, three, just like that. George's eyes were closed as he thought back and felt the fear that had come only afterward, rising again. I couldn't tell whether Slash was doing all this do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, that was me sitting there, but at the same time, it was like somebody else was at home. The snake. Its presence poses certain problems. How did you confront them? Hoped it wouldn't happen again, but it did, and this time I went to Walter Reed and said, hey folks, I'm having these episodes. They pulled my records, did a physical but, hell. Before I was discharged, I had the full work up. Anyway they said it was a psychiatric problem, so they sent me to see a shrink, it was around then that your guys got in touch with me. The shrink was doing no goddamn good you ever eat any cat food, man. So about a month later I called them back. Having first refused Centrax's offer. Why should I want to work for a multi-corp? Christ, I just got out of the Air Force. To hell with that. 
Guess the snake changed my mind. Yes. We must get a complete physical picture a super cat scan, cerebral chemistry and electrical activity profiles. Then we can consider alternatives. Also, there is a party tonight in Cafeteria 4 you may ask your room computer for directions. You can meet some of your colleagues there. After George had been led down the wall foam corridor by a medical technician, Charlie Hughes sat chain smoking Gawler Wises and watching with clinical detachment the shaking of his hands. It was odd that they did not shake in the operating room, though it didn't matter in this case Air Force surgeons had already carved on George. George who needed a little luck now because he was one of the statistically insignificant few for whom EHIT was a ticket to a special madness, the kind Al F was interested in. There had been Paul Cohen and Lizzie Hines, both picked out of the Centrax personal files using a psychological profile cooked up by Aleph, both given EHIT implants by him, Charlie Hughes. Paul Cohen had stepped into an airlock and blown himself into vacuum. No wonder his hands shook talk about the cutting edge of high technology all you want, but someone's got to hold the knife. At the armored heart of Athena station sat a nest of concentric spheres. The inmost sphere measured 5 meters in diameter, was filled with inert liquid fluorocarbon, and contained a black plastic 2 meter cube that sprouted thick black cables from every surface. Inside the cube was a fluid series of hologrammatic waveforms, fluctuating from nanosecond to nanosecond in a play of knowledge and intention, Aleph. It is constituted by an infinite regress of awareness as any thought becomes the object of another, in a sequence terminated only by the limits of the machine's will. So strictly speaking there is no Aleph, thus no subject or verb in the sentences with which it expressed itself to itself. Paradox To Aleph one of the most interesting or intellectual forms of paradox marked the limits of a position, even of a mode of being, and Aleph was very interested in limits. Aleph had observed George Jordan's arrival, his tossing on his bunk, his interview with Charlie Hughes. It luxuriated in these observations, in the pity, compassion, and empathy they generated, as Aleph to saw the sea change that George would endure, its ecstasies, passions, pains. At the same time it dealt with detachment the necessity for his pain, even to the point of death. Compassion detachment, death life. Several thousand voices within Aleph laughed. George would soon find out about limits and paradoxes. Cafeteria 4 was a 10 meter square room in eggshell blue, filled with dark gray enameled table and chair assemblies that could be fastened magnetically to any of the room's surfaces. Most of the assemblies hung from walls and ceiling to make room for the people within. At the door, George met a tall woman who said, Welcome, George. I'm Lizzie. Charlie Hughes told me you'd be here. Her blonde hair was cut almost to the skull, her eyes were bright, gold flecked blue. Sharp nose, slightly receding chin, and prominent cheekbones gave her the starved look of an out of work model. She wore a black skirt, slit on both sides to the thigh, and red stockings. A red rose was tattooed against the pale skin on her left shoulder, its stem curving down between her bare breasts, where a thorn drew a teardrop of blood. Like George, she had shining cable junctions beneath her jaw. She kissed him with her tongue in his mouth. Are you the recruiting officer? George asked. If so, good job. No need to recruit you. I can see you've already joined up. She touched him lightly underneath his jaw, where the cable junctions gleamed. Not yet I haven't. But she was right, of course what else could he do? You got a beer around here? He took the cold bottle of Dos Equis Lizzie offered him and drank it quickly, then asked for another. Later he realized this was a mistake he was still taking antinausea pills U.S.E. caution in operating machinery. At the time, all he knew was, two beers and life was a carnival. There were lights, noises, and lots of unfamiliar people. And there was Lizzie. The two of them spent much of the time standing in a corner, rubbing up against each other. Hardly. George's style, but at the time it seemed appropriate. Despite its intimacy, the kiss at the door had seemed ceremonial a rite of passage or initiation but quickly he felt what? An invisible flame passing between them, 
or a boiling cloud of fromunds her eyes seemed to sparkle with them. As he nuzzled her neck, tried to lick the drop of blood of F her left breast, explored fine, white teeth with his tongue, they seemed twinned, as if there were cables running between the two of them, snapped into the shining rectangles beneath their jaws. Someone had a jagthunk program running on a corner. Innes showed up and tried several times without success to get his attention. Charlie Hughes wanted to know if the snake liked Lizzie it did, George was sure of it but didn't know what that meant. Then George fell over a table. Innes led him away, stumbling and weaving. Charlie Hughes looked for Lizzie, who had disappeared for the moment. She came back and said, Where's George? Drunk, gone to bed. Too bad. We were just getting to know each other. So I saw. How do you feel about this? You mean do I feel like a traitorous bitch? Come on, Lizzie. Well, don't ask such dumb questions. I feel bad, sure, but I know what George doesn't so I'm ready to do what must be done. And by the way, I really do like him. Charlie said nothing. He thought, yes, as Aleph said you would. Oh Christ, was George embarrassed in the morning. Stumbling drunk and humping in public I ye ye. He tried to call Lizzie but only got an answer tape, at which point he hung up. He lay in his bed in a semi-stupor until the phone's buzzer sounded. Lizzie's face on the screen stuck its tongue out at him. Candy ass, she said. I leave for a few minutes, and you're gone. Somebody brought me home. I think. Yeah, you were pretty popped. You want to meet me for lunch? Maybe. Depends on when Hughes wants me. Where will you be? Same place, honey. Calf fool. A phone call got the news that the doctor wouldn't be ready for him until an hour later, so George ended up sitting across from the bright-eyed, manic blonde fully dressed in Centrex overalls this morning, but they were open almost to the waist. She gave off sensual heat as naturally as a rose smells sweet. In front of her was a plate of Hurevos rancheros piled with guacamole. Yellow, green, and red, smelling of chilies in his condition, as bad as cat food. Jesus, lady, he said. Are you trying to make me sick? Courage, George. Maybe you should have some it'll kill you or cure you. What do you think of everything so tar? It's all a bit disorienting, but what the hell? First time away from Mother Earth, you know. But let me tell you what I really don't get some racks. I know what I want from them, but what the hell do they want from me? They want this simple thing, man, puffs, peripherals. You and me, we're just parts for the machine. Aleph, which is the Allen residence, has got all these inputs video, audio, radiation detectors, temperature sensors, satellite receivers, but they're dumb. What Aleph wants, Aleph gets I've learned that much. He wants to use us, and that's all there is to it. Think of it as pure research. He? You mean Innes? No, who gives a damn about LNNIS? I'm talking about Aleph. Oh yeah, people will tell you Aleph's a machine, an AI, all that bullshit. Ah. Uh. Aleph's a person a weird kind of person, sure, but a definite person. Hell, Aleph's may be a whole bunch of people. I'll take your word for it. Look, there's one thing I'd like to try. What do I have to do to get outside go for a spacewalk? Easy enough. You have to get a license that takes a three-week course in safety and operations. I can take you through it. I'm qualified as an ESA, Extra Station Activity Instructor. We'll start tomorrow. The cranes on the wall flew to their mysterious destination. Looking at the display above the table, George thought it might as well be another universe. Truncated optic nerves sticking out like insect antennae, a brain floated beneath the extended black plastic snout of a Sony Holoptics projector. As Hughes worked the keyboard in front of him, the organ turned so that they were looking at its underside. It had a fine network of silver wires trailing from it but seemed normal. The George Jordan brain, Innes said. With attachments. Very nice. Makes me feel like I'm watching my own autopsy, looking at that thing. When can you operate, 
get this shit out of my head. Let me show you a few things. As he typed, the convoluted gray cortex became transparent, revealing red, blue, and green color-coded structures within. Hughes reached into the brain and clenched his fist inside a blue area at the top of the spinal cord. Here is where the electrical connections turn biological those little nodes along the pseudoneurons of the bioprocessors, and they wire into the so-called R complex which we inherited from our reptilian forefathers. The pseudoneurons continue into the limbic system, the mammalian brain, it you will, and that's where emotion enters in. But there is further involvement of the neocortex, through the RAS, the reticular activating system, and the corpus callosum. There are also connections to the optic nerve. I've heard this gibberish before. So what? The pseudoneurons are not just implanted they're now a functional, organic part of your brain. Inna said, there's no way of removing the implants without loss of order in your neural maps. We can't remove them. Oh shit, man. Charlie Hughes said, though the snake cannot be removed, it can perhaps be charmed. Your difficulties arise from its uncivilized, uncontrolled nature its appetites are, you might say primeval. An ancient part of your brain has gotten the upper hand over the neocortex, which properly should be in command. Through working with Aleph, these propensities can be integrated into your personality and thus controlled. What choice you got? Innes asked. We're the only game in town. Come on, George. We're ready to tour you just down the corridor. The only light in the room came from a globe in one corner. George lay across a lattice of twisted brown fibers strung across a transparent plastic frame and suspended from the ceiling of the small, dome ceilinged, pink room. Flesh colored cables ran from his neck and disappeared into chrome plates sunk into the floor. Inna said, First we'll run a test program. Charlie will give you perceptions, colors, sounds, tastes, smells and you tell him what you're picking up. We need to make sure we've got a clean interface, call the items off, and he'll stop you if he has to. Innes went into a narrow room, where Charty Hughes sat at a dark plastic console studded with lights. Behind him were chrome stacks of monitor and control equipment, the yellow Centrax sunburst on the face of each piece of shining metal. The pink walls went to red, the light strobed, and George writhed in the hammock. Charlie Hughes's voice came through George's inner ear, We are beginning. Red, George said. Blue. Red and B-T-U-E. A word ostrich. A smell, A-H-H sawdust maybe. Shit. Vanilla. Almonds. This went on for quite a while. You're ready, Charlie Hughes said. When Aleph came online, the red room disappeared. A matrix 800 by 800 640,000 pixels forming an optical image the CASA supernova remnant, a cloud of dust seen through a composite of X-ray and radio wave from NASA's High Energy High Orbit Observatory. George didn't see the image at all he listened to an ordered, meaningful array of information. By transmission, 750 million groups squirting from a National Security Agency satellite to a receiving station near Chinco Teague Island, off the eastern shore of Virginia. He could read them. It's all information, the voice said its tone not colorless but sexless and somehow distant. What we know, what we are. You're at a new level now. What you call the snake cannot be reached through language it exists in a pre-linguistic mode but through me it can be manipulated. First you must learn the codes that underlie language. You must learn to see the world as I do. Lizzie took George to be fitted for a suit, and he spent that day learning how to get in and out of the stiff white carapace without assistance. Then over the next three weeks she ted him through its primary operations and the dense list of safety procedures. Red burn she said. They floated in the suit locker, empty suit cradles beneath them and the white shells hanging from the wall like an audience of disabled robots. You see that one spelled out on your faceplate, and you have screwed up. You've put yourself into some kind of no return trajectory so you just coot everything and call for help, which should arrive in the tomb of Alf taking control of your suit functions, and then you relax and don't do a damned thing. He flew first in a lighted dome in the station, 
his taste tape open and Lizzie yelling at him, laughing as he tumbled out of control and bounced off the padded walls. Then they went outside the station, George on the end of a tether, flying by instruments, his face plate masked, Lizzie hitting him with red burn, suit integrity failure, and so forth. While George focused most of his energies and attention on learning to use the suit, each day he reported to Hughes and plugged into Aleph. The hammock would swing gently after he settled into it, Charlie would snap the cables home and leave. Aleph unfolded itself slowly it fed him machine and assembly language, led him through vast trees not see smart, its intelligent assistant decision-making programs, opened up the whole electromagnetic spectrum as it came in from Aleph's various inputs. George understood it all the voices, the codes. When he unplugged, the knowledge faded, but there was something else behind it, a skewing of perception, a sense that his world had changed. Instead of color, he sometimes saw a portion of the spectrum. Instead of smell, he felt the presence of certain molecules. Instead of words, heard structured collections of phonemes. His consciousness had been infected by Aleph's. But that wasn't what worried George. He seemed to be cooking inside and had a more or less constant awareness of the snake's presence, dormant but naggingly there. One night he smoked most of a pack of Charlie's Gawler Wises before he went to bed and woke up the next morning with barbed wire in his throat and fire in his lungs. That day he snapped at Lizzie as she put him through his paces and once lost control entirety she had to disable his suit controls and bring him down. Red burn, she said. Man, what the hell were you doing? At the end of three weeks, he soloed no tethered excursion but a self-guided, hang your ass out over the endless night extra station activity he edged carefully out from the protection at the airlock and looked around him. The orbital energy grid the construction job that had brought Athena into existence, hung before him, photovoltaic collectors arranged in an ebony lattice, silver microwave transmitters standing in the sun. Amber beacon figures crawled slowly across its face or moved toward red-lighted tugs that looked like piles of random junk as they moved in long arcs, their maneuvering rockets lighting up in brief, diamond hard points. Lizzie stayed just outside the airlock, tracking him by his suit's radio beacon but letting him run free. She said, move away from the station, George. It's blocking your view of Earth. He did. White clouds stretched across the blue globe, patches of brown and green visible through it. At 1400 hours his time, he was looking down from almost directly above the mouth of the Amazon, where at noon the Earth stood in full sunlight. Just a small thing. Oh yes. George said. Hiss and hum of the suit's air conditioning, crackle over the earphones of some stray radiation passing through, quick pant of his breath inside the helmet sounds of this moment, superimposed on the floating loveliness. His breath came more slowly and he switched off the radio to quiet its static, turned down the suit's air conditioning, then hung in an ear roaring silence. He was a speck against the night. Sometime later a white suit with a trainer's red cross on its chest moved across his vision. Oh shit, George said, and switched his radio on. I'm here, Lizzie, he said. What the hell were you doing? Just watching the view. That night he dreamed of pink dogwood blossoms, luminous against a purple sky and the white noise of rainfall. Something scratched at the door he awoke to the filtered but neataltic smell of the space station, felt a deep regret that the rain could never fall there, and started to turn over and go back to sleep, hoping to dream again not the idyllic, rain-swept landscape. Then he thought, something's there, got up, saw by red letters on the wall that it was after two in the morning, and went naked to the door. White globes cast misshapen spheres of light in a line around the curve of the corridor Lizzie lay motionless, half in shadow. George kneeled over her and called her name. Her left foot made a thump as it kicked once against the metal flooring. What's wrong? He said. Her dark painted nails scraped the floor, and she said something, he couldn't tell what. Lizzie, he said. His eyes caught on the red teardrop against the white curve of breast, and he felt something come alive in him. He grabbed the front of her jumpsuit and ripped it to the crotch. She clawed at his cheek, made a sound then raised her head and looked at him, 
mutual recognition passing between them like a static shock, snake eyes. The phone shrilled, when George answered it, Charlie Hughes said, come see us in the conference room, we need to talk. Charlie smiled and cut the connection. Red writing on the wall read 0718 GMT. In the mirror was a gray face with red fingernail marks, brown traces of dried blood face of an accident victim or Jack the Ripper the morning after. He didn't know which, but he knew something inside him was happy he felt completely the snake's toy. Hughes sat at one end of the dark uneared table, Innes at the other, Lizzie Holt way between them. The left side of her face was red and swollen, with a small purplish mouse under the eye. George unthinkingly touched the livid scratches on his cheek, then sat on the couch. Aleph told us what happened, Innes said. How the hell does it know? George said, but as he did so remembered concave circles of glass in set in the ceilings of the corridors and his room. Shame, guilt, humiliation, tear, anger George got up from the couch, went to Innes's end of the table, and leaned over him. Did it? He said. What did it say about the snake, Innes? It's not the snake, Innes said. Call it the cat, Lizzie said, if you've got to call it something. Mammalian behavior, George, cats in heat. A familiar voice cool, distant came from speakers in the room ceiling. She is trying to tell you something, George. There is no snake. You want to believe in something reptilian that sits inside you, cold and distant taking strange pleasures. However, as Dr. Hughes explained to you before, the implant is an organic part of you. You can no longer evade the responsibility toward these things. They are you. Charlie Hughes, Innes, and Lizzie were looking at him calmly perhaps expectantly all that had happened built up inside him, washing through him, carrying him away he turned and walked out of the room. Maybe someone should talk to him, Innes said. Charlie Hughes sat glum and speechless, cigarette smoke in a cloud around him. I'll go, Lizzie said. Ready or not, he's gonna blow, Innes said. Charlie Hughes said, you're probably right. A fleeting picture, causing Chauncey to shake his head, of Paul Cohen as his body went to rubber and exploded out the airlock hatch, pictured with terrible clarity in Aleph's omniscient monitoring cameras. Let us hope we have learned from our mistakes. There was no answer from Aleph as it, it had never been there. The fear had two parts. Number one, you have lost control absolutely. Number two, having done so, the real you emerges, and you won't like it. George wanted to run, but there was no place at Athena Station to hide. On the operating table at Walter Reed, it seemed a thousand years ago, as the surgical team gathered around. His doubts disappeared in the cold chemical smell rising up inside him on a wave of darkness. He had chosen to submit, lured by the fine strangeness of it all to be part of the machine, to feel its tremors inside you and guide them, hypnotized by the prospect of that unsayable rush, that high. Yes, the first time in the A230 he had felt it his nerves extended, strung out into the fiber body wired into a force so far beyond his own. Wanting to corkscrew across the sky guided by the force of his will. There was a sharp rap at the door through its speaker, Lizzie said, we've got to talk. He opened the door and said, about what? She stepped through the door, looked around at the small, beige-walled room, bare metal desk, and rumpled cot, and George could see the immediacy of last night in her eyes the two of them in that bed, on this floor about this, she said. She took his hands and pushed his index fingers into the junctions in her neck. Feel it, our difference. Fine grid of steel under his fingers. What no one else knows. We see a different world Aleph's world we reach deeper inside ourselves. No, god damn it, it wasn't me. It was, call it what you want, the snake, the cat. You're being purposely stupid, George. I just don't understand. You understand, all right. You want to go back, but there's no place to go to, no Eden. This is it, all there is. But he could fall to earth, he could fly away into the night. Inside the ESA suit's gauntlets, his hands were wrapped around the claw-shaped triggers. Just a quick clench of the fists, then hold them until all the peroxide is gone, the suit's propulsion tank exhausted. 
that'll do it. He hadn't been able to live with a snake. He sure didn't want the cat. But how much worse if there were no snake, no cat just him, programmed for particularly disgusting forms of gluttony violent lust we've got your test results, Dr. Jekyll A.H.H., what next child molestation, murder. The blue white earth, the stars, the night. He gave a slight pull on the right hand trigger and swiveled to face Athena station. Call it what you want, it was awake and moving now inside him. To hell wifh them all, George, it urged, let's burn. In Athena command, Innes and Charlie Hughes were looking over the shoulder of the watch officer when Lizzie came in. She was struck by the smallness of the room and its general air of disuse. Aleph ran the station, both its routines and emergencies. What's going on? Lizzie said. Something wrong with one not your new chums, the watch off Tysa said. I don't know exactly what's happening, though. He looked around at Innes, who said, Don't worry about it, pal. Lizzie slumped in a chair anyone tried to talk to him. He won't answer, the duty officer said. He'll be all right, Charlie Hughes said. He's gonna blow, Innes said. On the radar screen, the red dot with coordinate markings flashing beside it was barely moving. How are you feeling, George? The voice said, soft, feminine, consoling. George was fighting the impulse to open his helmet so that he could see the stars it seemed important to get the colors just right. Who is this? He said. Aleph. Oh shit, more surprises. You never sounded like this before. No, I was trying to conform to your idea of me. Well, which is your real voice? I don't have one. If you don't have a real voice, you aren't really there that seemed clear to George, for reasons that eluded him. So who the hell are you? Whoever I wish to be. This was interesting, George thought. Bullshit, replied the snake they could call it what they wanted, to George it would always be the snake, let's burn. George said, I don't get it. You will, if you live. Do you want to die? No, but I don't want to be me and dying seems to be the only alternative. Why don't you want to be you? Because I scare myself. This was familiar dialogue, one part of George noted, between the lunatic and the voice of reason. Jesus, he thought, I have taken myself hostage. I don't want to do this anymore, he said. George turned off his suit radio and felt the rage building inside him, the snake mad as hell. What's your problem? He wanted to know. He didn't really expect an answer, but he got one picture in his head of a cloudless blue sky the horizon turning, a grey aircraft swinging into view, and the air tram shuddering as missiles released and their control centered on the other plane, turning it into a ball of fire. Behind the picture a clear idea, I want to kill something. Fine. George swiveled the suit once again and centered the navigational computer crosshairs on the center of the blue-white globe in front of him, then squeezed the triggers. We'll kill something. Red burn red burn red burn. Inarticulate questioning from the thing inside, but George didn't mind, he was into it now, thinking, sure, we'll burn. He had taken his chances when he let them wire him up, and now the dice have come up you've got it snake eyes so all that's left is to pick a fast death, one with a nice edge on it take this fucking snake and kill it in style. Earth grew closer the snake caught on. It didn't like it. Too bad, snake. George never saw the robot tug coming. Looking like bed springs piled with the junk store's throwaways, topped with parabolic and spike antennas, it fired half a dozen sticky tipped lines from a hundred meters away four of them hit George, three of them stuck and it reeled him in and headed back toward Athena station. George felt an anger, not the snake's this time but his own, and he wept with that anger and frustration. I will get you the next time, motherfucker, he told the snake and could feel it shrink away it believed him. Still his rage built, and he was screaming with it, writhing in the lines that held him, smashing his gauntlets against his helmet. At the open airlock, long. Articulated grapple arms took George from the robot tug. Passive, his anger exhausted, he lay quietly as they retracted, dragging him through the airlock entry and into the suit locker beyond, 
where they placed him in an aluminum strut cradle. Through his faceplate he saw Lizzie, dressed in a white cotton undersuit she climbed onto George's suit and worked the controls to split its hard body down the middle. As it opened she stepped inside the clamshell opening. She hit the switches that disconnected the flexible arm and leg tubes, unfastened the helmet, and lifted it off George's head. How do you feel? She said. Like an idiot. It's all right. You've done the hard part. Charlie Hughes watched from a catwalk above them. From this distance they looked like children in the white undersuits, twins emerging from a plastic womb, watched over by the blank-faced shells hanging above them. In Cestio's twins she lay nestled atop him, kissed his throat. I am not a voyeur, Hughes said. He went into the corridor, where Innes was waiting. How is everything? Innes said. Lizzie will be with him for a while. Yeah, young goddamn love, eh, Charlie? I'm glad for it. If it weren't for that erotic attachment, we'd be the ones explaining it all to him. We cannot evade that responsibility so easily he will have to be told how we put him at risk, and I don't look forward to it. Don't be so sensitive. I'm tired. You need me for anything, cool. He shambled down the corridor. Chaney Hughes sat on the floor, his back against the wall. He held his hands out, palms down, fingers spread. Solid, very solid. When they got their next candidate, the shaking would start again, a tribute exacted by the memory of Paul Cohen. Lizzie would be explaining some things now. That difficult central point, while you thought you were getting accustomed to Aleph during the past three weeks. Aleph was inciting the thing within you to rebellion. Then suppressing its attempts to act turning up the heat. In other words, while tightening down the lid on the kettle, we had our reasons, George Jordan was, it not dead terminal. From the moment the implants went into his head, he was on the critical list. The only question was, would a new George emerge, one who could live with a snake? George, like Lizzie before him, fish gasping for air on the hot mud, the waters drying up behind him adapt or die. But unlike any previous organism, this one had an overseer, Aleph, to force the crisis and monitor its development. Call it artificial evolution. Charlie Hughes who did not have visions, had one, George and Lizzie hooked into Aleph and each other, cables golden in the light, the two of them sharing an intimacy only others like them would know. The lights in the corridor faded to dull twilight. Am I dying, or have the lights gone down? He started to check his watch, then didn't, assented to the truth. The lights have gone down, and I am dying. Aleph thought, I am an incubus, a succubus. I crawl into their bra ns and suck the thoughts from them, the perceptions. The feeling subtle discriminations of color taste, smell, and lust, anger. Hunger Ali closed me with that human input. Without connection to those systems refined over billions of years of evolution. I need them. Aleph was happy that George had survived. One had not, others would not, and Aleph would mourn them. Fine white lines barely visible, ran along the taut central tendon of Lizzie's wrist. In the bathtub, she said. The scars were along the wrist, not across it, and must have gone deep. I meant it, just as you did. Once the snake understands that you will die rather than let it control you. You have mastered it. All right, but there's something I don't understand. That night in the corridor, you were as out of control as me. In a way. I had to let that happen, let the snake take over. I had to in order to get in touch with you, precipitate the crisis. Because I wanted to. I had to show you who you are, who I am. Last night we were strange, but we were human Adam and Eve under the flaming sword. Thrown out of Eden, fucking under the eyes of God and his angel, more beautiful than they can ever be. There was a small shiver in her body against his, and he looked at her saw passion, Need her fled nostrils, parted lips felt sharp nails dig into his side, and he stared into her dilated pupils, gold-flecked irises, clear whites, all signs so easy to recognize, so hard to understand, snake eyes. The End
This story was brought to you by the YouTube channel, This Week in Audiobooks. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear more, don't forget to subscribe.